Welcome to From His Heart, where today, Pastor Jeff Shreve is in an inspiring series entitled Roller Coaster, Facing the Ups and Downs of Life. In today's message, you'll learn how to wait patiently on God with endurance and trust in this lesson called, What's the Deal, God? We're in a series on selected psalms called Roller Coaster, facing the ups and downs in life. And we're looking at the psalms because psalms are so true to life. And psalms uh, pull back the veil as the psalmist, David and others, Asaph, as we're going to see today, they share how they feel about a situation. And they, they just let you know this is what's going on inside it's just raw, and it's, it's got emotion in it, and that's why I love the psalm so much. And in this psalm today, Psalm 73, Asaph, who was one of the musicians, one of the singers in, in the Levitical uh, line, he was in David's kingdom, and he was in David's court, and he was involved in worship. He was involved with the choir. And he got so frustrated and he was so frustrated that he was about to throw in the towel on his relationship with the Lord, about to throw in the towel on worship and just say, you know what, it's not worth it. This is what he says in Psalm 73, 11 through, verse 11 through verse 14 in the message version of the Bible. What's going on here? Is God out to lunch Nobody's tending the store. The wicked get by with everything. They have it made, piling up riches. I've been stupid to play by the rules. What has it gotten me? A long run of bad luck, that's what. A slap in the face every time I walk out the door. Mm. That's how he felt. And that's how many of us feel too. But we don't really verbalize it. Because it's like, mm, I'm not supposed to say that because that's the wrong answer. But you know, when you're honest before the Lord, you're able to tell him anything. And the Bible says, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. God's a safe place. And you can share with God how you feel. And you can share your frustrations with God. And that is what Asaph does. And he teaches us a lot about this question is serving the Lord really worth it? Psalm 73, I'll begin reading in verse 1. In the New American Standard Bible, it says this, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I want you to notice with me three insights from this psalm that help us understand and answer the question, is serving the Lord really worth it? Insight number one, we begin to question and doubt and wonder, is serving the Lord really worth it, when we begin to compare. Look at it again in verse three. For I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He began to look at what other people had. He began to compare his lot in life with the arrogant and the wicked and those who didn't know God and those who didn't follow God and didn't worship God. And he starts to look at and compare the two. And he's like, this just stinks you know, when I was in high school, I played basketball, and I still remember a cheer that our cheerleaders had. It was really a, a jeer. It was a taunt uh, to the other side, to the other team, and we only did it when we were ahead. But here was the cheer. Watermelon, watermelon, watermelon rind. Look at the scoreboard and see who's behind. Anybody remember that cheer? That's a good cheer. It's a good cheer. 
It's a good cheer if you're ahead. Can't really do it. You're getting beat by 20. Watermelon. No, you can't do that one. But that's what Asaph is doing. He's running that cheer through his head. He's looking at the scoreboard. He says, hey, I'm way behind here. Man, the wicked have everything, and I have nothing. And what's the deal? God. Hey, comparison produces one of two things. Both are bad. It produces either pride or envy. You know, you, can, you start comparing yourself with other people. One of two things, pride or envy. You compare yourself to person X, and you're doing a little better than person X. You have a better house. You have uh, better cars. You have a better job. You have uh, a prettier wife. You have uh, better kids, so to speak, in your mind. You think, well, my kids are doctors. Their kids, you know, well, they're working at, uh, you know, Chick-fil-A. And you just say, "Uh, I'm doing better than you are. And so you kind of puffed up. Man, I'm good. But then you compare to somebody else. It's like, man, he's got a bigger house than I do. He's got a better car than I do. He's got a better job than I have. His wife's a lot better looking than my wife. And man, his kid's the CEO of Exxon. I'm not doing very well. Boy, I wish I had what he had. Wish I had what she had. And you become envious. Now, God hates pride, very, very clear in the Scripture. There are six things which the Lord hates, Proverbs chapter 6. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. Number one on the list, a proud look, haughty eyes, it says in the New American Standard. God hates pride because pride is independence from God. I don't need you, God. I got it all handled on my own, and God hates that. And God also hates envy. When you're looking at what other people have and say, well, I'm getting the short end of the stick. See, pride says, I don't need you, God. And envy says, you're not fair, God. You're holding out on me, God. You're a dirty cheat, God. Because if you were right, if you were fair, I would have what so-and-so has. Comparison's a bad thing. It either inflates you with a big head, or it deflates you, and it turns your heart sour and bitter and rotten. And comparison, here's the bottom line with comparison. As I saw, he says, why are you uh, questioning, is it worth it to serve the Lord? Because I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Boy, I saw how high, wide, and handsome they live, and it's just not right, and it's just not fair, and they have so much more than I have. He's comparing Comparison means that you've gotten your eyes off the Lord. Bottom line, you've gotten your eyes off the Lord. You're not just looking to him anymore. The scripture says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 17, do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Don't look at the the sinners. Don't look at the wicked. Don't look at the the people that are living for self and and envying their lifestyle and envying the the fact that they, oh, man, they just go out and drink and they party and they, they do this and they do that and they cheat on their taxes and blah, blah, blah. And, boy, I wish I could do that. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. And it says in Hebrews chapter 12, Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, people who have gone before us who have been faithful, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. When it says fixing our eyes on Jesus in the Greek, that means you look to him and to nothing else. Don't take your eyes off him. Set them on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith. Is serving the Lord really worth it? Hey, we begin to question when we start to compare. He, oh, God is good to Israel, but man, I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Second insight, not only do, begin, do we begin to question when we begin to compare, but we begin to question when we begin to assume. We begin to assume. Assume what? Assume that those who are doing better than we are outwardly have it all together. Look what he says in verse 4 and following. Especially, I like the way it it words it in the Good News Bible. He says, the wicked, they do not suffer pain. 
They are strong and healthy. They do not suffer as other people do. They do not have the troubles that others have. And so they wear pride like a necklace and violence like a robe. Their hearts pour out evil and their minds are busy with wicked schemes. They laugh at other people and speak of evil things. They are proud and make plans to oppress others. They speak evil of God in heaven and give arrogant orders to everyone on earth so that even God's people turn to them and eagerly believe whatever they say. They say God will not know. The Most High will not find out. And then verse 12 in the New American Standard, Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease they have increased in wealth. Asaph gets his eyes on the wicked, on those that don't trust God, those that don't serve God, those that don't obey God, and he says, they have so much more than I have. What's the deal, God? And not only do they have more than I have, God, they are so much happier than I am, God. He begins to assume things about them. They are always at ease. When it says they're always at ease, that word ease means to be tranquil, to be secure, to be careless, to be trouble-free. I want you to think about that for a moment because we do the same thing that Asaph does. We look at people uh, who have a lot. Maybe they live in a big house or they have a big job or they're uh, some kind of celebrity, and we say, oh, the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Oh, if only I could be one of those uh, lucky, fortunate people who live like that, who have all those things, then I would be so deliriously happy. I want us to think about two questions. Question number one, are the wicked really enjoying peace and tranquility? I mean, is that true? Are they always at ease? They have increased in wealth. Do they live a trouble-free life? Are they just so uh, giddy and, and carefree and just have such security inside? Are they, are they experiencing the Hebrew word shalom, peace and well-being and everything's great? No, they're not experiencing that. All of us in this room have probably heard the name Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger is the king, has been uh, one of the kings of rock and roll for decades. The lead singer of the Rolling Stones and his sidekick, uh, Keith Richards, who uh, died in 1990, but nobody told him. And uh, so he's, he's still kind of breathing, but um, he's decaying. And uh, they're still at it. They've been doing this for 50 years. And their most famous song is the most honest song. These guys who have gone way down the road of drugs, sex, and rock and roll, they sing this song, I can't get no satisfaction. Because I try, and I try, and I try, and I try. I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. That's what I say. <laughs> You're not going to do it. There, there is no satisfaction in the things of this world. God didn't set it up that way. He didn't create you that way because in your heart there's a God-shaped vacuum. So Asaph looks out at the wicked and he sees all these outward things. There are no pains in their body when they die. Baloney, they have pain when they die. If you cut them, they bleed. I don't care how much money you have. And they have family problems. They have marital problems. Many of them have more problems than if they were never rich and famous. I was talking to Todd Williams the other day, superintendent at Pleasant Grove, and we were talking about uh, two people in particular whose lives are just careening out of control, Miley Cyrus and Justin Bieber, Matt's favorite singer. Uh, <laughs> those people, they would be a lot happier had they never experienced fame. Their lives are just a mess. You just see, it's like, Good night. You're just falling apart right before our eyes. You're not going to find satisfaction in those things. So, hey, we, we, is it, is, does it pay to serve the Lord? Is it worth it to serve God? Well, we question when we begin to compare. We question, number two, when we begin to assume how all these other people have it so great. But the third insight, we begin to see when we begin to seek God. We see the real score when we begin to seek God. So Asaph says this, verse 13. 
Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence, for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. I, I'm just getting smashed in the face every day while the wicked just prosper. And then he says in verse 15, if I had said I will speak thus, Behold, I should have betrayed the generation of your children. I got to be careful, God. I can't publicly say this stuff because then that's going to cause other people to stumble. And I don't want to betray the generation of your children. But boy, I'm coming close to slipping. My feet almost slipped, he says in verse 2. Then he says, verse 16, when I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. I don't understand why the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. Verse 17, until... I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. He came into the sanctuary of God and he started to seek the Lord and he started to see things clearly. Hey, we begin to see when we begin to seek God. Asaph was in the ministry. Levitical priest led in the choir, in the worship, in the playing of the instruments. But you know, he's just like everybody else. He can get away from the Lord. He can get his eyes off the Lord. He can maybe get out of church for a while. And you know, it doesn't take long. You get out of church and all of a sudden, your your mind starts to get warped and your world starts to turn upside down. It's, It's sad when you see people doing so well and they're coming week in and week out and week in and week out and then something happens and they miss. And then something happens again the next week, and then they miss. And then they miss a third time. And then they buy a lake house, and they're gone every single weekend to go to the lake. And their spiritual life goes down the tubes, and then they start having marital problems, and then they start having family problems, and they say, what's going on? You've been neglecting the sanctuary of God. That's what's going on. You know, we say, well, church isn't that big a deal. It's a huge deal. Because you need it, I need it, we need it. And we come together and we worship the Lord and we praise the Lord and we see things clearly when we sing his praises and when we study his word. So what did he begin to see when he sought God? The wicked are one heartbeat away from hell. That's what it says, verse 18. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction, how they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors, like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. One heartbeat away from an eternal hell. That's what the people that don't know God are. You might be here today and you say, well, I'm not so sure I know God. Well, then I want to tell you with love in my heart that you're one heartbeat away from everlasting hell. The Lord does not want that for you. Jesus hung naked on a cross for you so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. The veil of the temple was torn in two, as we sang, so that you could have access to God. But what happens to the wicked? What do we read about in the New Testament? Jesus told the parable of the man who had so much, and he said, oh, I have so many goods laid up for so many years. He's the guy that built bigger barns. And he says, oh, look, now everything is taken care of. I'm on easy street. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, fool, this day your soul is required of you. Now what are you going to do? Who's going to own all that you have amassed? You can't take it with you. And you're going to have to stand before me one day. In Luke chapter 16, there's the story of the poor man Lazarus and the rich man. He's not given a name, although the theologians like to give him a name. They call him Dives. Dives in Latin means rich man. And the rich man, Dives, is living high, wide, and handsome. He's got everything that he needs. The poor man Lazarus is begging at his gate. The rich man doesn't pay him any attention But then Lazarus dies, he's carried off to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man dives, he dies, and the scripture says in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Hell's a real place. It's a real place. And an unbeliever is one heartbeat away from hell. And how should that make us feel as Christians? When I was in Houston, I heard the testimony of Nabil Qureshi, the Muslim who became a Christian. And in his testimony, he was sharing at First Baptist Houston when I was there. 
And in his testimony, he said this, you know, all through high school, he said, I didn't have really anybody that I can remember that ever talked to me about Jesus. He said, except one girl. And she asked me one day in class if I knew Jesus, if I had a personal relationship with Jesus. Well, he was loaded for bear, and so he kind of dismantled her. But he said, it always struck me that of all the Christians that I knew in high school, she was the only one that ever asked me about my soul. And he said, I wondered, why don't the other Christians ask me? He said, either, number one, they don't believe it. They don't believe that I'm one heartbeat away from hell. They don't believe the gospel, that those who perish without Christ go to hell. Or number two, they don't care about me. Asaph said, hey, when I came into the sanctuary of God, then I saw the real story. And he closes out by saying this, there is nothing more wonderful than the presence of God. Oh, God, I was so senseless. I was like an animal before you earlier in this psalm. He said, I was so bitter. But then I realized, verse 28, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all thy works. It says in the easy-to-read version, as for me, all I need is to be close to God. That's what I need. I just need to be close to you, God. I need to keep my eyes on you, and I need to be close to you because no matter what's going on, if I have plenty or if I have nothing, if I'm close to you and I'm walking with you, then you have promised me love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And that's my birthright as a child of the king. And I can have those things. The nearness of God is my good. Let me close with this story. Suppose I were to put on the platform today $10 million in cold, hard cash. $10 million. Just stack it up. And I were to offer you this deal. Lay down your salvation Lay down your relationship with Jesus Christ just for one day, for 24 hours, and I will give you $10 million. Now, it's impossible to lay down your salvation for a day, but just suppose you could. If somebody offered you that deal, $10 million for your salvation just for one day, would you take that deal? Let me tell you three reasons why I wouldn't take that deal. Number one, I could die inside of those 24 hours and be separated from God forever. Number two, Jesus could come back during those 24 hours, and I would miss the rapture and the glories of the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I would have to go through the horrors of the tribulation. And number three, 24 hours with Jesus is better than $10 million any day of the week. My friend, the Lord wants to have a personal relationship with you, and it all starts when you open your heart to Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I put my faith and trust in you come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will save you and he will change you. He'll work in your heart from the inside out. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that this broadcast is making a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Today's message, What's the Deal, God?, is available in multiple formats when you call 877-777-6171 
or go online to fromhisheart.org. Life is a lot like a roller coaster with ups and downs that can delight and discourage. Now, this month, we want to help you thrive through life's struggles by sending you Pastor Jeff Shreve's encouraging booklet, In the Face of Discouragement. It's our thanks for your gift from his heart this month. And for your gift of $40 or more, we'll also include his uplifting and practical series, Roller Coaster, Facing the Ups and Downs of Life. It's available in multiple formats. These lessons from the Book of Psalms will encourage you to trust God in all the ups and downs of life. You can make your gift by calling 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. And thank you for helping us offer real truth, love, and hope to a lost and a hurting world. Thanks for joining us today. You know, this is an important month for us at From His Heart. It's Vision Partner Month. Now, Vision Partners are a very special group of regular monthly supporters. They're people that we can count on as we share the good news of Jesus around the world. So if this ministry has been a blessing to your life, would you prayerfully consider becoming a Vision Partner and lock arms with us so that we can together make an eternal difference for Christ. Now remember, I don't receive any income from this ministry. I'm a volunteer and I'm a vision partner. So I ask you to join me and our family of faithful monthly supporters in this endeavor. Now we have some wonderful gifts for new vision partners. Just go to fromhisheart.org and click the vision partner banner. Thanks so much for partnering with me. I look forward to sharing with you next week and each day on radio or anytime online. May God richly bless you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.